this is an introduction to the principles of the Alexander Technique. So I was just going to say hands up um, if you've got any prior knowledge of the Alexander Technique. So if there's something you know about it. Nice. Me, Helen, Jane, Jude. Great. So I hope um, I can give you, as well as whatever you know already, um, a bit of new information. So I've been using the principles of the Alexander Technique for the last 21 years um, to help, mainly to help people um, who have back pain, neck pain, postural problems, stress. Um, I teach very young people, I teach elderly people and all ages in between. So the technique is not specific to any uh, group of people or, or age, it's, it's for all really. Um, so Alexander's study is the use of the self. And we look at what are we doing? Um, are we causing difficulties ourselves? And, and then we ask ourselves a question, how can we help ourselves? And my experience of using this work with people is that it helps, it can help uh, a real multitude of difficulties that people experience. But I'm gonna start um, by showing you our skeleton. Uh, we're all the same underneath. So I don't know, I hope you can all see this. I can't see if you can see this, but I hope you can see more or less this, this skeleton. Um, and pretty much I'm guessing everybody is sitting, sitting like this at the moment. Um, just stick your hands up or, or put a virtual hand up if you have regular discomfort or pain of any sort. Back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, yes. One there, for sure. The others I can't see, but a whopping 80% of adults in this country experience low back pain at some point in their lives. So low back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, all these things that um, I've just talked about are so, so common. And when we look at this amazing structure that we all have, uh, I'm in awe of it. It's so simple. It's so elegant. Um, it's, it's so efficient that the more I work with people, the more I think this is, this is just genius. And when we look at it and we think, well, it's really, it's a pretty simple thing. We want to, we want to move around, so we use our legs. We want to sit down, we use our legs. Um, we want to do something with our hands, so we place our arms where we want them to go. And we sort of can, can start thinking this is a very complex thing to be working with, but it's not. It's a very simple thing. And when we start to apply the principles of how this works, which is what Alexander, uh, Alexander's study is, then we start to think, okay, well, if we go wrong, then we can surely put ourselves right again. And that is, that's what we're going to talk about now, how Alexander um, did exactly that. So you can say goodbye to the nice people, goodbye nice people, and you can go back to your perch. And I'm going to tell you the story now of how Alexander, FM Alexander, uh, came to develop the work that, that has been going on now for 130 years. And thousands and thousands of people have, have used it and benefited from it. So Alexander was born in Tasmania in 1869. Uh, he died in London in 1955. He was born on a farm uh, and he was frail as a child. Um, so he didn't work on the farm, but he had a great love of Shakespeare um, from a very young age. And so he, he eventually became a Shakespearean reciter. Uh, and age 20, he moved to Melbourne in Australia and he became quite well known. He carved out quite a nice profession for himself. But within two years, 
the first two years, he started suffering from voice problems. And like we all do, we have a problem, so we go to the doctor, and the doctor said, suggest you rest your voice. And it worked. Um, but unfortunately, when you went back on the stage again, the, the problem repeated itself. Now this could be, it happened to be the voice problem for him, but for us, it could be anything. It could be people who suffer from repetitive uh, strain injury, RSI, or repetitive back pain, or repetitive neck problems, or shoulder problems. So it was a repetitive problem. And very often we get told, well, go and rest it, and it works. And then we go back and do what we're doing again, and hey ho, it comes back again. And this is what he was he was faced with. And then one day he took on a particularly difficult assignment, and he was standing in the middle of the stage in his beautiful Shakespearean costume, and he lost his voice altogether. And he realized that this was potentially the end of his career. So then the next thing he did was something really quite remarkable. And he asked a question, which we rarely ask ourselves, which was, could I be doing something myself to cause this problem? So he went back to his doctor and he said, what do you think? Because there's no medical problem here. There's nothing, nothing that we can identify is going on. And the doctor said, well, that's a reasonable assumption, yes. So Alexander then said to his doctor, so can you tell me, what am I doing? And his doctor said, no, I don't know. So Alexander then went away, and this was really the birth of what we now call the Alexander Technique. Because he, he asked himself, well, he had to ask himself a question. If I'm doing something myself, what do I know about it? Because I'm not aware of anything. So he said, I know two things. I know whatever it is, is repetitive and it's unconscious. So if I just ask you quickly, any of you, if you have a repetitive but unconscious habit, how would you possibly go about, can you think, how could you possibly go about trying to find out what's going on? Maybe by a process of elimination, by trying to eliminate one thing that you're doing and seeing whether that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Except it was unconscious. Oh, right. Yes, of course. <laughs> <All unconscious. laughs> maybe not. <laughs> Um, maybe in this day and age, you could video, you just have video on and you might be able to watch the footage. In this day and age, very true, but well, not then. <laughs> 130 years ago, so no, we didn't have the option. Yeah. Is, it, is it something to do with watching yourself? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's so it's what Jenny said, but in in his time, mm -hmm. the mirror, the mirror, mm. absolutely, mm. yeah, absolutely. He decided he decided that I'm not conscious of anything at all, so maybe I can see something. So he surrounded himself with a bank of very undoubtedly beautiful Victorian mirrors, and. He started the most intensive study of human use, that is observing himself doing things, that has ever been done. He literally sat and watched himself. And to start with, he watched himself speaking and he couldn't see anything that he was doing at all. And then he remembered that when he'd actually lost his voice, he'd been doing quite a, a challenging um, performance. And so he thought, well, if maybe if I up the ante a bit and I go into my full um, presentation mode, maybe I'll, I'll, something will reveal itself, and it did. 
he saw he saw a habit that he was doing that he could he could um, identify was probably causing the voice trouble. What he realized as well, that he was looking at a physical habit. He could see in the mirror a physical habit that happened when he thought about speaking because the habit happened before he used his voice. So he could see a physical habit as a response to a thought. And then he came to understand one of the tenets of Alexander understanding is that we are psychophysically inseparable. So the mind and the body work as one at all times. So I'm going to show you the habit that he did. So he, he, he watched in the mirror and he was going to do this, this um, presentation. So the habit went like this. And, and if I try and speak now, you can hear very clearly that that's affecting my, my voice box. So understandably, Alexander thought, this is it. This, this is my habit. It's unique to me and it's clearly affecting my voice. But I'm just going to diverse a little bit here because what he came to understand actually was that this is a universal habit. Uh, and it's lucky in a way that, that he was looking at his voice or he might not have identified that, that this has been a habit, but it is. And it is a universal habit. And we're all doing it. So I'm going to do a little demonstration with you now. Um, it's a little bit different. I can't see you, obviously, most of you, but, but those I can see. Uh, if you can just turn sideways onto your screen. Well, you don't even need to do that, actually, but if you can do that. Put your hand on the back of your neck. That's great. And now go as if you were going to stand up. Just prepare yourself to stand up. Make the first move. And tell me if you can feel your head pressing down on your hand. So the habit is a universal habit and we can go into uh, why we all do this. Um, there are many, many reasons why we all do this, but it is an important habit. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on it at the moment, but um, if you just consider when we do that, uh, put the head back onto the spine like that. The head weighs five kilos, which is five liter bottles of water. Five liter bottles of water sitting on top of our spine. I mean, that alone is a miracle, isn't it? Um, and so when we displace it like this, we actually cause quite a, um, a problem through the body, down through the spine and through the body. So there are many reasons why this is not a helpful pattern. But if we go back to Alexander now, he, he thought, well, yeah, obviously that's affecting my voice, so I need to solve it. So would anyone like to have an idea, suggestion? So you pretty well all, those I can see, have demonstrated that I'm doing that. So how am I going to stop it? Because I've identified it's not helpful for me for many reasons. So how could I go about stopping it? Maybe looking differently because you would be looking up. So if you mm -hmm. make yourself look forward, you could try that. <clears throat> and that's what Alexander did, actually. Well, I'm, I'm putting it that way, so I'm not going to put it in the opposite direction. I'm going to keep it down. He intended to do that. And he felt he was doing that, but the problem continued. So eventually he had to go back to his mirror again and check if he was actually doing what he thought he was doing. And he was completely horrified because he saw at the critical moment of speaking, 
the head went back again. He couldn't, he couldn't stop it. And he wrote in his book, this, by the way, was years, this took years. It was absolutely a remarkable study. He wrote, I was at an impasse. And he now realized that the sensory feedback he was getting from his body was inaccurate. He thought he felt he was keeping his head down, but when he saw in the mirror, it was going back. So his body was, was giving inaccurate feedback. And he also realized that the use of his body, the way he was doing things, was affecting the functioning of the vocal mechanism. So these things he understood gradually led him to understand that these were not just unique um, problems that he had, but they are universal problems. And he came to understand that the way we use this amazing structure we were looking at earlier <clears throat> determines its ability to function well for us. The, but the body is so forgiving. We can do so much. We can, we can use it in so many ways that are unnatural, um, if you like, to a point, to the point where he got to where this was so severe that he actually caused himself voice loss. And, and it could have been uh, moving in ways that caused back pain or shoulder pain. Um, so where do you go from here? Because you've got a habit um, that continues despite your good intentions to do the opposite. You're not doing what you feel you're doing. So where, do, where does he go from here? It's a really tricky question. So it's the one that many, many people um, come to ask themselves. And I, I myself did actually, because I had uh, tennis elbow and <clears throat> frozen shoulder <clears throat> when I came to this work. And I was at an impasse. I didn't know how on earth to, to get rid of it. So what he did was he, he reviewed everything he knew. And he came to the idea or the realization that if he could get to the point between a thought of doing something, like using his voice, speaking, <clears throat> and the habitual response, physical response to it. So it's between the thought and the physical response to it. If he could pause, if he could get that moment and just pause, then there was a moment of choice and change. And this was getting to the, the fundamental source of the habit, which is the thought. And then he paused. And then he could work out gradually how to, how to continue. And this is really the foundation of Alexander's work, is to be able to develop that ability to meet the habit that keeps putting us wrong and to be able to stop in the face of that habit and then to, to work out, usually with a teacher, how, how you continue. Um, and then learning how to carry on without harming yourself. And so this is, this is I'd say this is the, the fundamental tenet of Alexander's work, was that ability to develop that inhibitory ability. And, it, and the, inhibitory, the ability to stop, to pause, is a natural human condition. But because we live in such fast-paced world, um, it's difficult. It's difficult to... Um, this is the foundation of the work. It's starting to recognise, am I, am I doing something to cause my problems? This is the first fundamental question. And then if we find we are, <clears throat> then, we, then we can develop the ability to to meet that, keep meeting that stimulus that's sending us wrong and being able to pause and stop and usually work with the teacher, an Alexander teacher, and find a way through it. 
because when we use this, this, this structure, you know, that we're looking at, that we all have, is subject to the laws of nature. And once we restore that relationship between the natural laws and the way this works to its best advantage, then, then we're far less likely to get into difficulties and, and harm ourselves. So I'm going to pause that and ask if anyone has any questions or comments. I just want to clarify, Carol, that when you're saying just that part that you're talking about now, creating a gap mm -hmm. between the thought and the action, mm -hmm. that is our natural way of being and something has culturally or, or whatever over time broken that down is that right yeah i'd say that is right okay that is right so that so when we then practice the technique then we're then we are restoring ourselves back to that natural part mm. okay. yeah i'm not sure we ever go back anywhere but i think we go forward <laughs> so i think we, we we learn again that how to manage ourselves without I mean, the, the, the words in, in Alexander language for this, and one of them is end gaining. And we are, we become end gainers and we get very focused on the goals. And then we forget what's happening between my, my wish for a goal and my getting myself there. And what am I doing with this amazing instrument in the meantime? Mm. Yeah. So we reconnect the mind body as a resource. The two always working together. I'm just going to suggest now that, that for a moment, we're in a moment we're going to do uh, a lie down, a knees up, ease up, lie down, um, and I'm going to guide you through it. And you don't have to lie down. You can sit on a chair. That's absolutely fine if you, if you can't lie down somewhere. Um, but for a moment, I'm just going to say, can we just practice a moment of taking a step back away from the screen. You can even turn sideways if you like, because you'll still be able to hear me. And just have a moment of <clears throat> feeling your, your sitting bones underneath you if you're sitting or, or if you're standing your feet. And then perhaps because you've moved a little bit, perhaps you can realize that maybe you weren't sitting as comfortably because you wanted to be near the screen or you had to be as you could have been. And then if you can just let your eyes really relax and you could be aware of your peripheral vision. So the vision around the side of you. And then you could be aware of your breath. And just feel any sense of being pulled back towards the screen because you don't have to be at your screen. And just have a sense of yourself now in the space you're sitting in. And we're part of it, of course. We're part of all the space around us. And then when you're ready, just come back to your screen and tell me, tell me if you feel a little bit different. When you uh, said the perif peripheral vision, that, that was really relaxing for me because I then realized that I was focusing very intently on the screen and actually moving further and further forward to get involved in what you were saying. 
Mm. So actually standing away like that um, was really helpful. Yeah, I could look back at what I was doing and I, I wasn't actually very comfortable sitting either, like you suggested. Really interesting. It's it's lovely to be reminded to take a moment just to connect or reconnect or whatever the word is or whatever the um, but to stop doing and just to be in a moment. Um, it makes things feel much more natural rather than not even being aware that things were unnatural previously. So it becomes more natural. So in that way, it, re it reminds one, if you're talking about habit, for example, how the habit feels natural, but in fact, it's the unnatural state of being. And just in that few seconds, that becomes obvious. Yeah. Thanks, Jude. Absolutely. Because I'm standing, I felt very aware sort of my weight going down through my feet to the floor and I found that I was swaying a little bit so I wasn't absolutely still and then I felt that my knees were locked so I softened a little bit through my knees but I was still slightly swaying and then when I came back to the screen I felt a little bit lightheaded which oh. quite surprised me actually. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Demonstration of what I call find the gap every now and then in life. Just find the gap and, and restore oneself. And one, one can really feel quite restored in a very short space of time. But I think as, as Jude said, uh, you know, our habit is, is, is just there all the time and we don't even recognize it anymore, as, as Alexander discovered. It's finding these ways of there are lots and lots of ways we can really help ourselves in a day just by having a little bit more awareness of, um, of what we can do. So I'm going to guide you now in a little bit of a longer session. Um, where are we? Yeah, we'll have about 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes altogether by the time you organize yourselves. So this is called a knees up ease up, lie down. So you're going to be, I've asked you to bring some books with you. Uh, if you can lie down, great. If, you, if I can see you, that's lovely. If not, it doesn't matter at all. If you can't lie down, um, then you can just be sitting on your chair or however you want to be. Um, well, that's nice. Somebody's actually got a, got a floor mat. And um, those I can't see, um, I'm, I'm assuming you're doing one of the three things. You're either standing, sitting, or lying. Um, and now you're going to, I'm going to just ask you to, let's do, the, for those that are lying down, <clears throat> to lie on the floor or, or wherever you're lying. To have, if you have a couple of books to put under your head. Uh, and then to have your knees bent. If you can, obviously, if anyone's got limitations, then you, you must um, pay attention to those. So the aim of this is, is to give you an understanding of the state you have now, <clears throat> which is the state you've arrived at. Um, at this part of your day. And then we do a lie down for 10 minutes. And then just to notice what the change of your, in your state is. And we're saying this because we carry around, most of us carry around in this amazing, beautiful structure we have, a lot more um, tension A than we need and B than we're aware of but once it starts to build up as a habit it, it just becomes the way we are and this is one thing you can do and I absolutely recommend it and ease up, ease up, lie down for 10 minutes and you can really begin to change your state and because you're, if you're lying down your whole frame is supported by the floor then the muscular system can really learn to, to release itself. 
And if you're sitting, then just become aware of your sitting bones underneath you and have your feet flat on the floor. And for those who are lying on the floor, become aware of your back, being supported by the floor, your feet, and your head. And then be aware of the space you're in, the space around you. And have a sense for yourself, a sense of safety. Often we don't have this sense of safety, but we're safe. And we're breathing. And it doesn't matter whether your eyes are open or closed, but just have a sense of letting the eye muscles be very soft and relaxed. And then I like to think when I'm doing this that I don't think of releasing tension. Otherwise one can get into the, the pattern of holding tension, releasing tension, holding tension, releasing tension. But if I think even with my Alexander hat on, all right, I have tension. I'm creating that tension, so can I have a little bit less? And maybe if you bring attention to your, to your skull, and we have a lot of muscles around the skull, around the face, so you could say to yourself, can I sense any tension around my skull, maybe between my eyes, my eyebrows, between my eyebrows? Can I have a little bit less? Can I think about my face, maybe not being pulled downwards, but maybe easing a little sideways? So I'm not, I'm not making judgments. I'm not saying I'm doing things wrong. I'm just saying, can I, right now, just do a little bit less? Have a little less tension in my throat. Just observe my breathing. And am I using my abdominal muscles in my breathing? Because ideally, I will be. Can I just extend my exhalation just a little bit? Can you bring your awareness through your torso to your hip joints where your legs join your torso? And could you have a little less tension around there? The joints are where we tend to um, overstabilize ourselves. And then if you bring your awareness from your hip joints to your knees. Could there be a little less tension in your thighs? Can you bring your awareness now from your knees down to your ankles? 
And maybe think about the ankles just softening away from the knees. And then be aware of your feet, the soles of your feet resting on the floor and being supported by the floor. And then your whole body being supported, your arms, your shoulders. And as the body, as the frame, the structure of the body is supported, and especially if you're lying down. So the muscular system can let go of some of its habitual holding. And then the body literally, the frame literally lengthens up the spine, the discs in the spine, between the spinal vertebrae, begin to plump up again. And and the parts that can widen, the shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle, can widen the ribs, can widen because we're just taking, literally we're taking some pressure off. So we, we will literally lengthen and widen. And then we just take up a little bit more space and we have a bit more freedom for our breathing our circulation, our digestion. So Take your time, take your time. And then when you're ready, bring yourself back to the room you're in, where you're sitting or lying, and your breath. And then do a stretch, like an animal, when animals um, rest, the thing they always do before they move is to stretch. So you could stretch your arms or you might feel like stretching your legs or moving your head a bit, but give your body a little bit of a stretch. And that prepares your muscular system then to, to move again, to be ready for movement. So then when you're ready, you can just bring yourself back up again and then come back to your screen when you're ready. So it'd be very nice to hear from you um, how you found that. That was that was really um, helpful. Um, I, I found that when lockdown started and I was working from home and constantly sitting, not moving about, speaking to colleagues or you know moving about in an office, that I I became really aware of just sitting down for so long and um, what I did in the end I used to um, in the morning open out my yoga mat on the floor um, next to my desk as a reminder that sometimes I needed to just lie down and um, stretch and that really helped me um, because I, I would just have I mean I've suffered with, with back pain for a while but just something to remind me to 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 come out of the position that I'm in and actually just stretch and relax. And I tried to do that several times a day. It didn't always work, but I, I would consciously open up the yoga mat in the morning just to, as a trigger. 
Great. So it's such a good idea. It's so, so easy, isn't it? And I think lots of us found this during lockdown. It is so easy to spend hours on a, on a computer without realizing how time is just flying by. Yeah, good. I'm glad you found that useful. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that, uh, Caroline. It was, I, I loved the idea of relaxing bit by bit because, you know, it, when I maybe meditate or whatever and, and you start and say, okay, relax, and it doesn't actually mean anything to my body at all because I can't just relax. But the idea of concentrating or thinking of bit by bit relaxing was was really nice. Yeah, really helpful. Mm. Yeah, I think I think trying to use the same mind that's intention to say to the body relax is not going to work most of the time. Well, I hope it was helpful. And I think it can just maybe help to remind us that it's so easy just to drive ourselves through the day and forget about this incredible instrument that's um, working for us. And um, to just have a sense of what we're doing to it and with it. And, and how easy it can be to change our state um, just by stopping and recognizing what, what we're up to. It's, it's as Jenny said, it's putting things in place, isn't it? Um, to remind oneself to that you can take positive control of how we are, um, rather than be on, that, on a kind of a wheel of, of, of not even being aware of what we do. And whether it's putting your yoga mat down beside your desk, as Jenny talked about, or to whatever that we put in a trigger uh, to remind us not to keep doing what we do all the time, just to come off that. I think it's a very nice idea to have a little something like your yoga mat, which is a great idea, because then the mind just goes, oh yeah, I can see that. So are there any questions or comments that anyone would like to make? All these conditions that we've got, the back pain and the shoulder stuff and whatever, mm -hmm. if, if we did that lying down every day for 10 minutes would that would your skeleton kind of naturally find the right way of being or is it linked in with that gap that you have to have not that that, that was badly put the gap that you were talking about between the thought and the action um if you had uh let's say repetitive lower back pain and you did this for 10 minutes every day i doubt if that would be enough to overcome your habits because you're then going to be doing the habits for the other 23 and a half hours or 23 hours and 50 minutes. But I think actually it can be, if you were to do it and really commit yourself to it, I think it can be a, a remarkable teaching tool because I think you'd come to learn all sorts of things about yourself and your condition and your mind and your body and what's going on. So that, that in itself could awaken some sense of further exploration. But I do think it's very advantageous as well. And if someone in the middle of a busy day can say, well, look, there's my yoga mat. I'm going to spend 10 minutes on my yoga mat now. Um, that is really taking control of, of one's, one's own health. I'm just going to finish up by just reminding you of the three main principles of the Alexander Technique, which which is where we kind of started, and that is accepting psychophysical wholeness. So we always act as a whole, a mind, body, spirit, whole. Um, and that, so that's one of the fundamental tenets of this. We can't divide ourselves up, and um, not successfully anyway. And the next one is the way we use our body affects its ability to function well. Um, so we can limit um, the body's ability to, to really function well. Um, and that we are subject to the laws of nature. So we can go so far and the body will be incredibly accommodating. But there's a point beyond which it can't, it can't cope. So then we need to, we need to take responsibility and, and find a way to, to help ourselves. And the three most difficult challenges we meet 
when we're trying to put ourselves right, which Alexander understood, was that we are end gainers, as I mentioned before. So we want the goal, we, we see the goal, and we don't pay attention to how we're going to reach the goal. And if we think about the body and, you know, if we get into difficulty with our body, then we need to start saying, all right, how, how am I using this, this amazing instrument that I've got? Uh, the other challenge we meet is mind wandering. We're mind wanderers. Right, everyone's nodding. <laughs> <laughs> mind wanderers. Um, but we, you know, it's something that mind wandering, um, Again, it takes us away from the present. It takes us away from what am I doing with myself now? Um, and it gets more and more powerful, mind wandering, um, not being able to be in the present moment. And you know, mindfulness, uh, everybody wants, wants to be mindful and yet we are, <laughs> we are incredible mind wanderers. And it is something that Alexander, um, Alexander Sessions addresses, his mind wandering. And then the other big difficulty we have is the feeling that we have to be right all the time. Um, we grow up with believing we have to be right. And what this inevitably does for us is drive us into uh, end gaining and drive us into holding an awful lot of effort and tension that we really, we really don't need. And we don't have to be right. And we can explore and we do with Alexandra explore by let's see what let's see what we're doing. Let's allow ourselves to make mistakes, and then we can we can get somewhere. 